and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I'm talking to internationally recognized eating disorder expert and nutritionist Melanie Rogers, who is founder and CEO of Balance Eating Disorder Treatment Center in New York City. Melanie is a professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies at New York University. She is a certified eating disorder registered dietitian and supervisor, and she is the founder and CEO of Manhattan-based Balance Eating Disorder Treatment Center, now Joint Commission accredited as a center of excellence with a facility receiving the gold seal of approval, an internationally recognized symbol of quality and safety in behavioral health care. There, Mulaney leads a team of medical clinicians, therapists, counsellors, nutritionists, dietitians, social workers and coaches, all dedicated to whole body and mind recovery for clients of all ages, races and genders, seeking to overcome both eating disorders and disordered eating. And among Mulaney's many affiliations, she is founder and past president of the New York City chapter of the International Association of Eating Disorders Professionals Foundation, an advisory board member at the Center for the Study of Anorexia and Bulimia, and a former board member of the Binge Eating Disorder Association. Renowned for creating unique treatment and recovery programs derived from a philosophy based on the principles of intuitive eating and health at every size, Mulaney regularly presents internationally on the latest scientific research and treatment paradigms within the eating disorder recovery community. Balanced eating disorder programs utilize an integrative therapeutic approach that incorporates evidence-based treatments into individualized recovery plans that include behavioral therapy, nutrition counseling, group therapy, and meal support to empower clients to develop a sustainable, neutral relationship with food, body acceptance, and positive self-esteem. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with Melanie today to hear firstly about her journey into eating disorders. I'm keen to hear about all the different research that's informing treatment and support of people suffering with eating disorders. And Melanie will also talk about the treatment approach at Balance Eating Disorder Treatment Center and how this uniquely supports people in their healing. Let's get to the conversation. Hi, Melanie. Welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. Hi there, Harriet. It's a pleasure to be joining you today. Oh, so Melanie, and can I get you firstly, please, to introduce yourself to the listeners? Absolutely, yes. I am an eating disorder specialist, a registered dietitian, eating disorder specialist and supervisor. I'm Australian, as you can probably hear from the accent, and I've been living here in New York and working in the eating disorder field for the last 20 odd years here in New York. And I opened my own outpatient eating disorder treatment centre here about 15 years ago. That's kind of how I spend my days is helping people on their journey to recovery. And I had my own lived experience with an eating disorder early in my 20s. So I come at it from a lived experience, but also clinical training. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. And Melanie, I think what really struck me when I was just like reading about sort of all the work you do is you're someone you've obviously had like a phenomenal impact and influence in the eating disorder field with treatment, research, advisory kind of level, etc. And I was thinking this has got to be someone I think, as you've just sort of mentioned, really, that is sort of driven by something really by a real kind of passion and purpose. And you say you have your own lived experience. Is that what sort of initially brought you into eating disorders? Not really. It's funny, isn't it, how these things can work? Not really. And I think really, Harriet, it was because I wanted to go into nutrition before I developed an eating disorder. And I was thinking more preventative. And then I developed the eating disorder in my 20s. And like many of us, I was in complete denial about it. But as I started to work as a nutritionist registered dietitian here in the States, I was exposed to disordered eating, of course, and Mm -hmm. eating disorders. And as I started to learn more and go to conferences, I realized, oh, my goodness, I realized I was putting the pieces together for my own journey and realized I had a full-blown eating disorder and was in quite a lot of denial about it. From that, that was when I also, with working with clients, 
I realized I knew what was going on inside their heads. And that's above and beyond what any book can train you in or teach you. I was finding that I was developing this really intense, strong therapeutic relationship with my clients because I really got it. The hook for me was kind of the lived experience wasn't the motivation originally, but because of the lived experience, I was able to forge this really incredible connection with clients and fell in love with the field. It's kind of, you know, the other way around, but it is absolutely a passion. Like I think a lot of us say that it's a calling, it's not a job. Yeah, and it makes a lot of sense. And I think you're not alone, are you, in not realizing perhaps that you had an eating disorder back in the day? You know, I think it's very tricky sometimes, isn't it, for people to identify that they have an eating disorder in our kind of diet culture, wellness world that very much validates a lot of these behaviors. Absolutely, exactly. I was running marathons and getting a lot of accolades for that sort of activity and interest. And it was really a bit of a camouflage for excessive exercise and part of the eating disorder. Yeah. So you are the founder and CEO of your balance clinic, which is based on sort of philosophy of sort of intuitive eating and health at every size principles in New York. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Could you tell us a bit more about balance and the different kind of sort of, you know, more about your sort of philosophy and the different sort of treatment programs that you offer? Yeah, absolutely. So I started Balance Harriet 15 years ago. And just to put it in context, 15 years ago in New York City, there was only one outpatient eating disorder treatment clinic. I think we need more than one. So I started Balance. But what I also noticed was not only the absolute shortage of resources throughout the US, and I would suggest even globally, but I also noticed that a lot of the treatment centers are founded and run by therapists, which is fantastic, like yourself. But what I noticed is there weren't any or very few registered dietitians who had started clinics. And as we know, the nutritional approach is as important as the therapy approach, because if we don't get the brain back online, and if we don't get the body kind of restoring itself through food and nutrition, then unfortunately, the clients are really limited in what kind of deep psychological work they can do. So they're just so imperative and they go hand in hand. Long story short, I opened balance and really put a lot of emphasis and emphasis on the nutritional piece, but we were one of the first in the States to introduce intuitive eating into our model and to certainly do away with exchanges, the diabetic exchanges, which you're probably familiar with. They were being used, but there was not improvisation. There was no creativity. No one was really leading the field as far as the nutrition piece was concerned to develop it further and look for different ways and approaches. That's what I aimed to do with balance was to really bring the nutritional piece up of equal importance. And then the therapeutic piece, I traveled for a month out in California where there's a lot of cutting edge work being done out there at the time. They were really leading the way. And so I adopted a lot of their therapeutic models and combined that with the nutritional philosophy that we developed with intuitive eating and health at every size and those modalities, which are really common now, but back then they weren't. That was really what I was trying to do is forge a place that was different and hopefully would appeal to clients and just support them in their journey. Mm. I can really imagine actually that 15 years ago, although I know like the intuitive eating principles were created, weren't they? Probably probably, yes. well, probably over 15 years ago, but they weren't kind of mainstream, were they back then at all? Not at um, all. So how did that look as well in terms of actually really bringing that nutritional piece sort of centerfold and really investing in that in perhaps in a very different way compared to some of the other clinics? Can you sort of just describe a little bit more about that in terms of how it looked for the clients? Absolutely. It was a lot more personalized because it was important for me also to keep our groups very small and have a high ratio of clinicians working with our clients. We could really customize. So if a client comes in and they're vegetarian or obviously with food allergies, we always accommodate, but also different religious backgrounds. You know, we can work with kosher. We can work with all different modalities and truly customize it. And that was something, again, 15 years ago, even up until the last five years, 
a lot of clinics weren't able to offer that customization. We also work with what we call a fear food hierarchy, if you will. So we kind of start with at that initial assessment with our clients, you know, what are the foods that they typically eat? What are foods that they're fearful of? What are foods that are terrifying? And we kind of rank from uh, green to yellow to red. And then the goal is over time, we use an exposure therapy model. So we're trying to help the clients move through eating different foods and exposing themselves to foods that are a little bit scary so that they can increase their repertoire, their variety. And also we're focusing in on ensuring that we are able to increase a little bit of fat. We know from the research, Harriet, that when clients increase variety in food choices and increase a little bit of their fat content, which a lot of our clients often are avoiding, that and carbs, we know that fat in particular and variety are incredibly indicative of prognosis, meaning that more variety and more fat increases the recovery rates and decreases relapse risk. Again, just trying to use the latest research of what we know medically and nutritionally, along with these other approaches. Intuitive eating is almost impossible, though, for our clients when they start because they're so disconnected from their internal regulatory system. But what we do is we introduce the concept. So we do a pre-meal planning. So we ask our clients, rate yourself as far as hunger, anxiety, food anxiety, set an intention and a goal for the meal. And then at the end of the meal, we would then do the reverse. So rate your fullness, rate your anxiety, rate your food anxiety. Did you meet your intention or your goal? So it's very mindful in that regard. And little bit by little bit, we find that our clients, they start off guessing at hunger and fullness, but as the body restores itself and some of that regulatory system comes back online, they're better able to kind of trust some of that signaling a little bit better through that process. So we kind of get that process started really is what we're trying to do. Mm, It sounds so helpful, actually, just that really sort of gentle hand-holding, isn't it? And really gradually reintroducing the fear foods because I think so many people who struggle with eating disorders love the idea of intuitive eating principles and stepping into that space. But it's just way too much too soon, isn't it, if you just try to go from eating disorder into intuitive eating without that kind of gradual sort of stepped approach where you can just step out of your comfort zone bit by bit. It makes a lot of sense. And I really like the way that you're sort of introducing the intuitive eating kind of model and principles in a very sort of gentle way, almost from the very beginning, even though I guess the clients aren't going to be able to say that they're not going to know if they're hungry or full probably or whatever to begin with. But You're sort of like just beginning to flex that muscle, I guess, aren't you? Just little by little from the very beginning. Absolutely, absolutely. And what we found here, Harriet, that kind of more gentle approach, because what we were finding is that when my clients, I was in private practice before I started Balance, and when my clients were, if they destabilized and they had to go into treatment, the model back then was also kind of almost like a force feeding. There was an enormous amount of food that needed to be consumed from day one. And I was noticing that my clients were absolutely traumatized. I think I can say that realistically, they were absolutely so overwhelmed with that kind of, it was really flooding would happen, speaking from a trauma approach. That was where I started to really think about what are we doing? And I don't think this approach is is helpful. We need to find a middle ground. So again, more nuanced is really what we've tried to do with our nutrition approach and philosophy here. Mm. And I think as well, as you're sort of saying about the customized meal plans as well, being able to kind of be flexible to clients of dietary requirements and specifications, et cetera. I think that's just such a person-centered approach and a way of working, isn't it? Because if someone can actually really state their preferences, as long as it's not being led by the disorder, you know, but if they are sort of genuinely vegetarian or have kind of religious requirements, whatever, you can be very responsive to that. And I think already then that really helps kind of build relationship, build safety, engagement, doesn't it, in the whole treatment process? 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Great phrasing there, the client-centric approach, which I'm sure in the UK, perhaps similar as well. This is kind of a newer philosophy, which sounds ridiculous that it's client-centered as opposed to the treatment center kind of knowing this is the way we do it and you fit in with our model. And we know that that just is not appealing to people and they don't feel safe and they feel infantilized, disrespected, all these different feelings can come up from that kind of an approach, you know, more of an institutional approach. The client first, the person first, human first approach. I think for all of us, we prefer to be treated that way if we're ever in a situation and needing help and support. Mm, Yeah, you're so right. Time for a short advertisement break. Now, I know we talk a lot about food freedom on this podcast and how important it is to take care of yourself mentally and physically as you learn to navigate a culture inundated with toxic messaging. One of the best ways to take care of yourself is through exercise. But I know it can be really hard to find an exercise program that isn't rooted in these toxic messages and doesn't feel triggering. Well, I recently met Katie, the owner of an amazing new exercise company called We Shape. We Shape doesn't focus on calorie counting, tracking how much you work out, or making you feel bad about your body to get you motivated. Instead, they create a customized exercise routine for you that helps you connect with and care for your body rather than feel the pressure to change it. They help you learn to set intentions that come from a place of self-care rather than self-judgment and they support you every step of the way with an amazing community and live coaching so you can make exercise a self-care practice that helps you feel better in your body and about your body. Plus, they're giving listeners of the show a chance to try it out for two full weeks for free. Just head on over to weshape.com forward slash freedom or check out the link in the show notes to get started today. And Mulaney, when you went out to California then to investigate some of the different therapeutic models and like, can you tell us a bit more about that and kind of what you sort of kind of really influenced and inspired by when you were sort of putting your program together? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I came to learn, um, Harriet, that the East Coast, which is obviously where New York is, the East Coast was a little bit more conservative. Psychoanalysis, this was kind of where it all started as far as for America a little bit more conservative, whereas on the West Coast, California, LA, et cetera, a little bit more willing to push the edges of the envelope and explore things. So as we know in treatment of eating disorders or any medical treatment, there is gold standard evidence-based treatment modalities to follow. All those evidence-based treatment modalities were once upon a time experimental and What we're finding with the evidence-based models is, for example, CBT, 50% of clients respond to CBT. So my question was, what are we doing for the other 50%? And I wasn't able to get any answers. So that's why I went out to California to say, hey, what are you guys doing out here? And are you seeing some really good promising work. And again, 15 years ago, yoga was not a mainstay or mindfulness was not a mainstay of any of our approaches. DBT, I think, was only just really starting to get some airplay. Radically open DBT certainly wasn't a concept, but that came from the West Coast as well. And then things such as drama therapy, which has its roots, I think, in gestalt therapy, drama therapy, and Just the non-verbal expressive art therapies are so important because, as we know, a lot of our clients don't know what they're feeling. That's actually a hallmark of an eating disorder for many people is an inability to describe their true emotions or what they're feeling. So it makes sense that we should incorporate some therapies where you're not so dependent upon the kind of intellectual verbalization of feeling states, but rather can express them non-verbally, such as, as we said, through drama, through art, through music. So I incorporated an actively hired creative art therapist. And to this day, we always have a fully credentialed expressive art therapist on the team so that our clients get different ways of working through and getting to hopefully the root cause of what's going on for them. So that was just a couple of examples there from yoga to the art therapies that were going out on and embraced on the West Coast and yet to arrive on the East Coast at the time. Yeah, and it's so interesting, isn't it? Because that these days those things sound so much more mainstream. But I mean, back in the day, I guess it was like you were kind of ground breaking, groundbreaking territory, weren't you? 
to your point, Harriet, I got a few eye rolls. You know, people were looking at me and rolling their eyes like, oh, yoga, you know, and now we've got all this wonderful research that supports it and the art therapies as well. And so, yeah, to your point now, it's so mainstream. And at the Balance Clinic, do you have like sort of an inpatient and outpatient programs? How does it work? Um, we're, we're outpatient only. So we have a full day program that's 30 hours a week meaning that our clients come in for a six to seven hour day. They do two meals and a snack and then three therapy groups plus individual therapy and nutrition. And we also have family therapy in there. So for our clients who come in for 30 hours a week, they're usually taking uh, medical leave from school or from work. So it's a pretty big commitment. The next level up, as you well know from us, would be a client going to residential. So they'd be going somewhere and staying 24-7. So we're the level just below that. So we have clients who hopefully can do good work with us and don't need to go to that next higher level. Or we also have clients who've been away to residential and then step down, come back to New York and join us for our day clinic. We also have an evening program that's nine hours a week. And so that's one meal plus two groups with individual therapy and nutrition as well. So that's called an intensive outpatient program. IOP, and we can also add on a Saturday program for that as well. That's our main intensive programming. And then, of course, we have one night a week body image groups and a men's group, et cetera, depending upon demand. Mm, Yeah, sounds very comprehensive, actually. Very busy, I'm sure, you and your team. And do you have people, Melanie, of all kind of diagnoses or what do you sort of think about diagnosis or whatever? How does that kind of work within the clinic? Yeah, we absolutely do. So we work with any clients, obviously, with anorexia through to bulimia, through to binge eating disorder, which is actually my area of specialty. And then, of course, atypical anorexia, which we're now finding is probably even uh, has a higher rate of clients struggling with atypical anorexia than even the other diagnoses. We've also seen an uptick in recent years, Harriet, in ARFID, Avoidant Restricted Food Intake Disorder, or AKA used to be called picky eating. And we've seen an uptick in guys and guys who are kind of around that 18 to 22 age group, which is interesting where they're just starting to get out in the world and maybe want to start dating if they haven't already and are realizing that this is an impediment to them being able to live life more fully. So seeing them come in at that age with that motivation has been really interesting and very, very We've seen some terrific, terrific recovery with that and vast improvements in quality of life for that group of people. And then, of course, being in New York and also very near and dear to my philosophy, we are LGBTQ allies and I think about 25% of my staff actually are members of the LGBT community. So we try really hard for the staff to represent our community so that when clients in come into us, they can hopefully see themselves reflected in the staff that are here as well. Mm. Do you want to say a little bit more as well about, because I guess, you know, anyone who's in the LGBTQ community is probably more vulnerable to disordered eating, body image issues as well sometimes, because that's even more pressure sometimes, isn't there? I think to perhaps look a certain way and also just the kind of stigma and stress that you might experience in society could make you more vulnerable with your mental health and possibly with eating issues. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's actually astounding. I think the statistics are somewhere around 25 to 30% plus of the LGBT community struggle with eating disorders or at very least disordered eating. And part of that is, as you could imagine, if you're questioning your sexuality or sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera, and combine that with the enormous amount of pressure there is to look a certain way. Plus, obviously that's a trigger, but we also know for our LGBT community, not every family is safe and certainly depending upon we your community may not be safe either. Enormous vulnerabilities there psychologically. And an eating disorder, the way I like to think about it is it's kind of a protective behaviour that kicks in to try to give us a sense of the very least control and it's a very reductive kind of way of phrasing it. But if you think about it as a protective mechanism, 
when you're feeling emotionally overwhelmed, I think it makes sense that we see such high rates. Mm, yeah, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Because I think for so many people, like an eating disorder becomes almost like a kind of life raft or something that's safe and known, isn't it? When life is a bit overwhelming and out of control and there's a lot of difficult feelings to try and process, it can be the kind of one thing maybe in your life that you can cling on to, that control of food or control of your body. Absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely hitting it on the head there. It's just devastating because for our LGBT community, they've got enough they're dealing with and trying to work through and make sense of, et cetera, et cetera. And then you layer on an eating disorder on top of that. It's just heartbreaking. Yeah, and incredibly hard. So Melania as well, I know you said you're kind of quite interested or specialist in binge eating. So yeah, what are your kind of major thoughts on binge eating? Because I know, you know, there's a lot of talk about binge eating, about kind of doing the whole kind of regular eating, stabilizing blood sugar or that side, and then the kind of looking at our emotions and self-soothing and I'm massively oversimplifying things. But I'm just wondering as well, like, what's your kind of take on binge eating? Because I know so many of my listeners are binge eaters and um, always the most popular episode. So any like little pearls of wisdom you have to share, we're really interested to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, binge eating disorder, it's very near and dear to my heart. And also because only here in the, well, DSM-5 and the ICD-10, is it? We only just got a diagnostic code here in 2013, which to put that in perspective, I think anorexia, that diagnosis was developed in the late 70s, early 80s, and then bulimia, I think, was in 83. Massive, massive decades and decades of not having an actual diagnosis for this. Point being, I think, a lot of weight bias and weight stigma that goes around that. So for a lot of our binge eating disorder clients, Many, I think about 75% will gain weight over time as a result of that particular eating disorder. And then when we're in this very kind of idealistic beauty ideal where women particularly are, you need to be thin to be attractive, et cetera, et cetera. There's just so much there with that body image and that toxicity of diet culture. What we've also seen, Harriet, is with binge eating disorder, for a lot of our clients, they actually started off doing what they were told to do, which is to go on a diet. Or maybe they felt uncomfortable in their body as a teen or as a young adult, some you know life transitions going off to college or moving out of home and gained a few pounds and then started dieting. And then after dieting, they may have lost weight and then they regained some weight plus some. And we now know that that happens for 95% of people. And what we then saw is a number of people went from this kind of yo-yo dieting to then disordered eating, to then full-blown binge eating. We regard diets, as you know, as a gateway behavior to an eating disorder. And for our binge eating disorder clients, for many of them, they were doing exactly what the doctor ordered, only to set them up to develop this full-blown eating disorder. So it's just heartbreaking. So what we try to do with our binge eating disorder clients is First and foremost, try and rebalance the distribution of food throughout the day because we know physiologically, if you're skipping breakfast or not eating until the afternoon, that your blood sugars start to go down, you start to kind of get tired and cranky. And at that point, your body physiologically is going to push you towards finding food and consuming food because every day the body needs a certain number of calories. So just understanding, I think, that we can set ourselves up for binging. We call these physiological binges. And we like to differentiate between a physiological binge, which is not eating soon enough or enough throughout the day, and hence the body is starving, literally, that leads to a binge. We like to separate that out from an emotional binge, which may not and often is not related to hunger. It's more emotionally kind of motivated. And then, of course, we see a combination of those where one may start out as being hungry and go into a binge and then feel so awful about doing that behavior that may then trigger subsequent binging that can continue for hours and hours. So working with our clients to redistribute food throughout the day and to then over time also start to learn hunger and fullness cues. What we notice with our binge eating disorder clients, Harriet, is 
they'll often wait until they're extremely hungry because that's when they pick up on the hunger cues. And that's part of many years, perhaps, of denying hunger, not wanting to start eating because they're afraid they'll binge if they do. So trying to get that back, push that back a little bit to more subtler expressions of hunger and eating in a more timely way, eating more consistently. And that way we're able to balance out the blood sugar levels and the different hormones, et cetera, and physiologically set our clients up for more success. And I have to say, one of the binge eating disorder for adults is one of the research suggests it takes a lot longer to fully recover from than from bulimia and anorexia. And I've worked with a couple of clients now that I've been working with for, gosh, over 10 plus years. And they're at the other point, you know, they're at the other side where they don't binge anymore. They may have an urge to, but they're able to cognitively talk themselves through it. And because they're so tuned into hunger and fullness, even if they did attempt to overeat a favorite food, they just can't. They get to a point where they're like, I'm full, I can't eat anymore which is like a revelation to realize there's kind of this emergency break that's actually working now. Sorry, I've thrown a lot out there, but it's just a beautiful process to help clients work through that and start to feel safe again and to trust their body and to feel safe around food again. Yeah, no, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing through that and just talking through that really helpfully because I think it just so resonates with the work that I do with my clients and I know my listeners as well. So they'll find that just really helpful just to kind of really have that validated. I'm so interested as well that you're saying about kind of binge eating disorder as well. Sometimes it can take the longest almost to do that kind of work to recover from. Because I think as well in services, particularly in the UK, probably more resources are thrown at anorexia and bulimia and probably less so at binge eating. So it's just not been as understood, has it, or been taken as seriously until more recently? Absolutely, yeah. Not taken seriously, confused with dieting. And then unfortunately, as we well know, there's a lot of stigma out there for individuals who live in higher weight bodies. And there's a lot of negative connotations that are associated with that and with people being in different body shapes and sizes that are not the beauty ideal, shall we say. There's just been so much that's been assumed and it was incredibly inaccurate. And hence, you know, we don't have a lot of good research yet, all of that. And I think just ultimately people struggling and suffering for far longer than they really should and need to, Harriet. I know as well, the thing that really frustrates me, I'm still on a lot of the kind of really popular podcasts and really excellent podcasts that we have sort of in the UK and, you know, worldwide, I think that are really sort of spreading valuable messages and educating a lot of people in very helpful ways. Still, whenever there is a nutrition kind of or nutrition or research kind of type guest, it is always never addressing the psychological aspect of relationship with food. And I'm sort of thinking of so many of my clients, I'm sure of yours as well, constantly have this sort of wellness message, don't they? Kind of you're here on a certain podcast, you just need to be intermittent fasting or being a carnivore or I don't know, like really be sort of obsessive about your gut microbiome. And it's like an echo chamber of all these messages. And I think it's so confusing for people, isn't it, really? Because of them, when they're coming into treatment, we're trying to sort of educate them in different ways to find much more kind of body acceptance, to have a different view of health. But still, so much work needs to be done to change the kind of collective view and understanding around eating and well being. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, Harriet. And I have to say, as you were saying that, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, It's so confusing, isn't it? It's so confusing because how does the average consumer know if, in fact, this is a good idea to do intermittent fasting? It sounds like it's a good idea. They're raving about it and saying it does this and that. And I'm thinking to myself, I am so glad that I'm trained in this area. And even then it's confusing. But I've spent years looking at the research and realizing, no, none of these add up. None of them, you know, when I started in the field, Atkins had been revitalized yet again. And you see this kind of cyclical place of going through what we call the macroeconomics. So, you know, with Atkins, carbs were bad, but fat and protein, eat all the bacon you like kind of approach was all the thing. And before that, it was no sugar. I remember my grandmother drinking Tab, which was one of the first sugar-free soft drinks, I think, that came out. 
And we've gone through all these different iterations of the carb and the fat and the, well, protein's always been pretty high, but now it's moving away from animal protein. So now it's vegetarian or even vegan. And now we're down to the tiny. So it's just another another iteration of not listening to your hunger and fullness cues and biologically kind of being respectful of what your body needs. Yeah, it's just so confusing. And unfortunately, the industry being so clever, the industry meaning the diet industry, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, they've been so clever in moving away from using the word diet. And now it's kind of they've co-opted this word health and wellness. So it's this idea of thinking about the person holistically, but not really. It's the same stuff, just in a different cover, if you will. Anyway, yeah, enormously confusing. And the bottom line, as we well know, is that when people go on diets or manipulate their food to achieve weight loss is that for the vast majority, 95% will regain weight plus some. And it's the additional plus gain over time that we now think actually is the biggest contributor to the medical conditions that some people can develop as a result of uh, weight gain over time. And that's the real kicker. Mm, Sure. And that's not highlighted at all, is it? And the people, these same people are being encouraged, aren't they? Like if they're going for a health appointment with their doctor or whatever, they're being encouraged to start another diet, aren't they? Which is then perpetuating that cycle. And actually, it sounds like worsening their health often in many cases. Absolutely. And exactly because so many clients come in and say, well, my doctor told me I need to lose 10 pounds or whatever it may be. I think the big thing that most people don't know is that our doctors are not trained in this at all. Well, here in the States, definitely not. I don't know what you're seeing there, Harriet, but I know in Australia, it's the same. They're not getting trained in this. And up until very recently, registered dietitians, which is my field, we're supposedly the food experts. We were still being trained using calories out and weight loss, which is just horrific to think that my own field where we're the specialists, this research wasn't truly being embraced at the university level. And registered dietitians have had to do a lot of unlearning here and a lot of relearning around um, how to support people from a health perspective and a health at every size approach with intuitive eating were found to be just really terrific approaches. Mm, yeah, helpful to hear, isn't it? And I guess it's, you know, being very compassionate to health providers who are doing the best they can, aren't they? And big brother from above is kind of just terrified of the world becoming overweight and not looking at it through this whole other lens. But no, it's fantastic to hear about the fantastic work you're doing and Melanie. So Melanie, with your clinic, do people have to be sort of local to the clinic or do you do any kind of, because I'm sure some people listening are going to be thinking, oh, that sounds like my ideal place to go. (laughs) Is it for local people or do you offer anything virtual at all? Yeah, we offer a little bit virtually, but with licensure and such, the clients that we treat with our licensed professionals, they have to actually be in the state of New York to be able to benefit from virtual services. What we do do, though, is I run a free support group once a month on a Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time here in New York, which is probably around 7 p.m. your time or something like that, Harriet. So that's one thing that is beyond borders, so to speak. We often have an international crowd on that. And if someone in the UK was looking to come on over to New York, then certainly if you were going to do an extended stay here and look at doing some treatment with us, that's always a possibility. We've helped people set up accommodation and such. We've actually had a couple of people from different countries who always wanted to visit New York anyway, so they decided to kind of put the two things together and do treatment and have an extended stay. So unfortunately, because of the licensure and the way it works, we're a little limited in being able to provide services to people like a full-blown program, for example, to someone in the UK at this time. But hopefully one day we'll be able to pull down those barriers and just provide care where it's needed. So, Melanie, for perhaps people as well that are more kind of local, if they want to find out more about the clinic, how do they kind of find you in terms of like social media, the website, et cetera, for anyone listening who might be interested? Yeah, absolutely. Our website is balanced. That's balance with a D, balanced 
tx.com. You can check us out there on our website and our Insta is the same handle. So you can check us out on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, for sure. Okay, fantastic. Well, Melanie, I'd just like to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Just really inspiring to hear about work you're doing. And I can just really hear that this is something that's just really from your heart and obviously having a really inspirational influence. Yeah, it's just been lovely to chat to you. So thank you so much. You too, Harriet. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me today. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. And do go and check out all Mulaney and the Balanced Eating Disorder Treatment Centre details in the show notes. If you're not following me already on Instagram, do seek me out at the eating disorder therapist underscore. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. If you're a professional listening, you may be interested to sign up for my online courses in eating disorders and body image issues. Links in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening today and I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon.